guiding document. I'm such a dork. I put mine in a desktop size and I take it with me wherever I go. A lot of tonight's information came out of this. This is the one for the Prescott. This is a guiding document designed with public input. This was not done in a, a bureaucratic government vacuum. This has community and public input in this. So I just want folks to know that, you know, this is, it has a lot of good information in it so and it drives our project design how we design a project where are we going to cut trees how and then implementation how are we going to cut the trees and then monitoring did we have the effect we said we would okay, okay. this is by night i i am I am. So I think I hit that one. No, next. Enter. It's not giving me enter. It's not giving me anything, Robert. So there you go. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So the next slide is, it's a list. So just, I'm, I just wanted, and it's more of a list for effect. It's a list of all the federally listed species and the ones that have habitat. And what, what is important to understand is under the Endangered Species Act, the species and the habitat are treated as two separate entities. And we have to analyze the effects to both and we have to discuss them and consider them. And so it was more of a list for effects purposes than anything else. The next slide is another huge list. See, you're not gonna have to see them. We're just gonna skip right over them. Um, and I think they'll be incorporated into the video of this talk. And if anybody would like to request my PowerPoint, I can certainly try to make it available on the Prescott Audubon Society website. So the next list is, um, uh, is Forest Service sensitive species. What happens is the Forest Service, um, am, I, am I back in business? Yeah. Thank you. So, I'm going to go back one. These are my listed species. And you see the spotted owl has critical habitat. The willow flycatcher has critical habitat. And then we have some fish, a lot of fish, and some snakes, and the western yellow-billed cuckoo. OK? So that was just, and those are the sensitive species for, just for the Prescott. There are over, there are hundreds of sensitive species in just region three. Region three is just Arizona and New Mexico because of the diversity. And so um, 
we're going to look at, so what does a million acres look like? Depends on where you are. That's a lot of country to cover. So this table came right out of our forest plan, and it's a breakdown of each vegetation type. The, it's the potential natural vegetation type. See, there's the 1.2 million acres. I hate tables. I love pie charts. Because they show a picture, and that you can talk about it. So what I did is I grouped them. And let's look at this biggest one. This biggest one is the pinion juniper evergreen shrub. Picture that, pinion juniper with evergreen shrub. Those are your evergreen oaks, the oaks that keep their leaves. And if you add the 7% of pinion juniper woodland, that is just pinion and juniper, that's 40% of the forest. That's a ton, that's over a third. Then the next biggest chunk is this orange one, and that's a, a category all by itself. Chaparral, chaparral, we all know what chaparral is. And then we've got the grasslands. You've got semi-desert, Great Basin, and juniper grasslands are another quarter of the forest. That's a lot for grasslands. Ponderosa pine is 9%. It's, the, the, it's, it's these two right here. And the riparian, our favorite, where we all like to go birding, See that little sliver right there? That 1%? Oh, that's the desert. Where's my, oh, my riparian's over here. So the desert is 1% and the riparian is 1%. Probably some of the more unique areas. And why is the Prescott National Forest so diverse? Why do we have so many different vegetation types um, in 1.2 million acres? And has anyone ever heard of a bird conservation region? BCR, bird conservation region? Good, they are, they are uh, delineated by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And it's a way to manage for species of concern, bird species of concern in specific. So the Prescott National Forest actually has three different, little bit of the desert right there, and um, these other two. And so let's look at that at a much larger scale. This is the North American bird conservation regions. See how, I mean, and we are literally at the convergence of, of three of them right there, 16, 34, and 33. And that, that's the, our little forest, and you see how big some of these are. These, could, these in, have entire states in them, and our forest has three. So that's why everyone has the most miserable allergies possible. <laughs> And, but the beautiful thing is, we're going to go back to the, and, and that, you can, you can just type in bird conservation region and it'll bring up, it'll get this map. And there's a different, each region has a different list of species associated with it that is of concern, that's been identified by the Fish and Wildlife Service in concert with other agencies of species of concern based on those vegetation types. And so don't, this map is just for concept only. Each different shade of gray is a different vegetation type on the Prescott National Forest. Yes? Okay. And so um, there is this, you see the mosaic and you see the little dots and you see all of that. That means that has a little different vegetation type in the middle of another one. And I mean, this is like, you know, those, those three vegetation types coming together don't come together cleanly like those little lines on the map. They spill over, they bleed over. And so everywhere you're seeing all of these mosaics, boy, the diversity of the habitats just going through the roof. It just is. And you know, that can be, it, it's interesting to have this. It's funny when you do a mapping exercise based on vegetation, because just, to, just for a laugh, um, based on vegetation types, Sonoran Desert tortoises should be at Palace Station, okay? So if you find one and I don't get a picture of it, you will be in trouble. So, um, so some species can even be found within the small inclusions, okay? So I promise there are, oh, see, so we're going to start, I'm going to go through the different vegetation types 
and, and, and kind of talk about the different species you would expect to find there. Here's why, before we even get there, why am I doing this? There's one of me and there are, I'm going to be generous, I'm going to say I'm talking to 30, 40 people. How many people are active in your chapter? Quite a few. How many? Like how, how many members do you have that are actively birding? Like maybe 50 to 100? That's a lot more people than me out in the field. And you people, most of you have more time to be out in the field than I do. And what I want you to understand is that when you have an incidental sighting of one of the species I'm about to tell you about, that is so valuable to me. That is so valuable to me. I don't know about it. I'm not with you. I don't know where everything is. So the reason I'm telling you about all of these species is I want you to tell me about them when you see them. So I'm going to break this down by the different vegetation types. Not to say that the animals are restricted to those vegetation types, but to say that's typically what we're looking for. And it was a way to, it's, it's a way to group things. It's so funny because they have this, um, they have a, I think it's a psychological test where they give you a bunch of species and you're supposed to sort them. Some people sort them by their, you know, kingdom, you know, their, their mammals or birds. Um, I sort them by the habitat types they occur in or what continent they occur in. So it's just, it all depends on how you think. So I did this by um, desert, the desert communities are um, less than 1%. They occur in the lowest elevations of the uh, forest and they're very weather influenced. Um, fires were rare, but if anyone's been around the Prescott for the last 20 years, I've lost count of how many fires have occurred on that front between Sunset Overlook and Crown King. And that is because of invasive grasses. For whatever reason, whether they came in with livestock, whether they were seeded in after a fire, whether they came in on the edge of a road on a vehicle. So the fire in the desert has changed that. And unfortunately, that's not having a good impact on animals like this. Now these animals are not federal. There are no federal species in the desert communities. The desert tortoise is a sensitive species. I have a crew that said they saw a desert tortoise once, and when I asked them for the photo, they said they didn't get one. I asked them if it was moving too fast for them. <laughs> and they said it was raining. I'm still mad at them. Um, I, uh, I literally put into contracts the requirement to photograph and get a GPS point of, ev of any tortoise encountered. Um, I don't want people picking them up. Um, I don't know if you understand this about them. Um, as a desert animal, I mean, their, their urine is actually very valuable to them because that is, they, that, they can keep wicking the moisture out of that. Their defense mechanism is to empty or avoid their bladder. So if you pick them up or startle them, you are subjecting them to some very stressful um, future if they can't get some water soon. Um, so if you encountered a desert tortoise in the road, you would want to wait for it to move. Uh, do not handle it with your bare hands. Um, and um, just wait for it to, to get out of the way. Uh, that would, should get you have enough time to take a picture and get a, get a point on a map. Because I don't know, I know we have desert tortoises out around Cleeter. I don't know where they are, but they've been documented. And I think I have up one picture of one crossing the road. So any encounter with a desert tortoise is greatly, greatly appreciated. Townsend's figured bats are a sensitive species that roost in mines. And a lot of, has anyone, does anyone know of Townsend Butte, which is down by Cleeter? I did not know this, but I, ironically it was named Townsend Butte. It was just was. The second largest maternity roost for Townsend's big-eared bats was associated with the mine at Townsend Butte. So, um, you know, if you ever see one of these, get a, pic get a picture, and, you know, I, I would like to know where th this species occurs. Um, very important, because their numbers are dwindling. Oh, where did my Gila monster picture go? There, okay. 
Um, I moved it and I didn't take the animation off. Gila monsters are just rare and noteworthy, just because they're super cool. Uh, they are venomous, please don't pick them up. And um, they can move quicker than you think, still get a picture. Um, they keep going on and off of the sensitive species list. Some people can't make up their minds. So that's why I like to keep tabs on sightings of them. Um, I encourage that. Phillips agave is um, one of the plants. And the other one, I'm just going to jump ahead, is the oh, Tonto Basin agave. Both of these, as you saw, are often associated with prehistoric human presence. That's a polite way of saying archaeological sites. Um, and they think that they were literally cultivated and carried from site to site. So a lot of times, so use that knowledge appropriately. Um, but it's just kind of a cool thing to note. Grasslands, OK? Grasslands occur at 3,000 to 4,500 feet, dominated by grasses and low shrubs. Fire is key in maintaining grasslands. What has happened is, we're so keen on uh, suppressing fire that the upland trees have come down the slopes. They used to burn and kill all those young trees, and they wouldn't get established. Um, what's the movie? Uh, Junior Bonner? Is that, is that the right movie? You look at that, and that, that was filmed here in Prescott, and it, the hillsides were grass. And now they're solid juniper. So um, fire is a huge key, that's a whole nother talk, um, fire is, um, in maintaining the grasslands. And we don't have any endangered um, listed species or sensitive um, animal species, but we all know what a, how the pronghorn are taking it in the shorts, especially this, this year. Um, I visited with the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Uh, they said we are uh, positioned to have this be the worst year on record for pronghorn. Um, I personally live in Chino Valley and saw a doe in the median by Ace Hardware that had been hit. They're coming into places they've never been. They're coming up on the sides of the highway to get uh, the, the ungrazed forbs. So I live in Chino Valley off of uh, one south on the east side, and I would say I am five or six houses off of the grassland. So you have to, it, it takes some doing to get to my house. I had a pronghorn in the lot next to me, grazing. And I, we've lived there 23 years, and that's never happened. So um, just keep your eyes out. But um, I just like to see them because someday we might not be able to see them. So that's why I tell my kids to keep their eyes open. Meadow larks are being considered as a focal species for the forest plan monitoring of grasslands. So they're native. They're year-round, and we are trying to monitor their presence on grassland habitats before, during, and after treatment to see if there's a change, to see if they can tell us about the effects of our, of our treatments. And so that is a species that um, we have transects that we, we go do. Um, we have what do we have? We have um, one, two, three, four, four volunteers in the room that have signed up with the, with the Forest Service to assist us on that. Um, and um, these focal species um, transects are, are pretty straightforward. And, um, but I, I, I mean, I don't want to blow up my inbox, but it'd be good to know about. I just like Swainson hawks. I see them all the time out in Chino and couldn't do a PowerPoint presentation about grassland without swains and hawks. Um, it's fascinating because I see them in the town of Chino Valley, in, in the town limits, like regular basis. And this year, I'm not seeing them. Not, I haven't seen. And, and last year, every morning on my way to work, always saw the same birds, always. Adults always have not seen a single adult Swainson this season on my way to work. So all the animals are very, I think, out of sorts with uh, the weather patterns this year. Sensitive grassland plant is green milkweed. Um, if you found this, we'd like to know about it, because we can't necessarily survey for all the sensitive plants out there. We'd love to know about them. So chaparral, remember, 
It's from 3,400 to 6,600 feet. Uniform, dense structure. It's just, we, we usually refer to it as a sea of chaparral because it's just like so thick and contiguous. The fire return interval is 35 to 100 years. That's normal. And they're stand replacing, and that's normal. And that's OK. That's what chaparral does. So the scrub jay has been uh, chosen as a focal species for this vegetation type. So we've got tran transects out throughout the chaparral um, tracking their presence. Um, before, during, and after treatments as part of a forest plan requirement. Pinion juniper, 40%. Um, it occurs from 4,500 to 7,500 feet. It's cold adapted evergreen woodlands with two species of pinion, the Colorado and the single leaf, and four species of juniper, the alligator, the one seed, Utah, and Rocky Mountain with some shrub components, okay? There are three types of pinion juniper habitats. There's grasslands, there's evergreen shrub, and then the woodlands, and the woodlands are the densest. The fire frequency ranges from one to 35 in the grassland, 35 to 100 in the evergreen shrub, and 35 to 200 years in the woodland. I keep waiting, I don't know. We've had a few fires in Juniper Mesa Wilderness and they haven't done a lot. They just kind of creep around and are low. Um, it's rare. It's rare to have a fire in the juniper vegetation type. So pinion juniper vegetation um, account for the largest portion of the vegetation types on the forest. They do not have any federally listed or Forest Service sensitive animal species, but they may have sensitive plants, such as the Arizona phlox or the Mern sage. Um, again, if you found these plants, because some people, I, I didn't want to just limit this just to birds, obviously, um, because the plants are the habitat for a lot of the critters that we're talking about. So ponderosa pine evergreen oak, you can feel it ramping up, can't you? We're getting to the, we're getting to the birds everybody wants to talk about. 6,000, oh, dang it, 6,000 to 7,500 feet. Um, you've got emery and Arizona oaks. And there can be some pinion and juniper in this vegetation type. It's the drier pines, the lower elevation and the drier. Um, historic frequent fire frequency is 6 to 12 years. I can tell you we've missed a few of those. Missed a few of those. Frequent low intense fires kept the forest very open. And two thirds of this, I, my, I didn't use too many acronyms, PNVT, you've already seen that, potential natural vegetation is in the wildland urban interface. So we're probably gonna manage it differently because it's right up against people's houses. And we need to be able to protect life and property. So we're gonna manage it to have a more frequent fire return interval and be more open. So, yep, let's cut to the chase. Northern goshawk is the main species of interest in this vegetation type from the list of, uh, it's a Forest Service sensitive species, okay? Um, it can be very territorial, even to humans near the nest. Has anyone encountered this? Anybody? No? Okay. I, oh, I had a friend, this is a funny story. He was out scouting firewood, and he um, was walking along. He was in uniform. He was, a, uh, it was a, a sheriff's deputy, so he had a white T-shirt, his vest, and his uniform shirt. And all he heard was whoosh. And this goshawk grabbed him on the shoulders with her talons, got it caught in the fabric. When it came loose, he said she was tumbling one end over the other the whole time, going bah, 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 just screaming at him. And I think he said he went home, put on clean pants, and then he brought me out there. And, and he sat in the car with the windows rolled up <laughs> while I walked around trying to find the goshawk. All I heard was whoosh, and I self-face-planted as she dive-bombed me. So um, if you do this officially, sometimes we require um, 
helmets and things like that for people that are doing things around goshawk nests. So they are very territorial. Um, if you're disturbing the bird, please leave the area. Okay, this is for you guys. Um, and make your notes later away from the nest. If you, are, if you have a goshawk, and they sound like this, leave, okay? And take notes later. Because you're keeping them from incubating, protecting the nest from a predator, bringing food back. And that's important. That's going to be the difference between um, success and failure of a nest. And so your information is incredibly valuable. You can get it back at the car, okay? You can make a, a, a pin drop on a, on a map. I'll send a field crew out there. They'll find it, okay? Let them sacrifice their lives for this. Um, and if you can note the age, whether it's a juvenile or adult, uh, the behavior and the location of the bird, it's going to be very, very critical. So I scanned this. Let's talk about this for a minute. This is a goshawk. This is not. OK? How many people know that most of the, a lot of the sightings in eBird claim they've seen this, and when we go out, it's this, OK? So be careful with your IDs, because I walked right up to Butterfly Spring, kept like that with my own voice, and the Cooper's Hawk just swooped right into me in, in 10 seconds. So let's just look, note, take your bird book, you know, if you can get, you know, get a picture. Actually, you know, kind of study this before you go out when you know you're going to be in the pine type because it's really, really critical, um, because sometimes all you get is that 10-second uh, that flyby, and you're done. And you have to have picked up on, did I see you know, uneven banding versus even banding? Did I see the white eye stripe? No white eye stripe. You know, um, how big was it? You know, 21 inches, 16 inches. Four inches may not seem like a lot, but this thing is big when this goes flying through. I mean, it, most people stop in the middle of, I know I was in the middle of a meeting with a bunch of people. One flew by and I just stopped. And they're like, what's wrong? I'm like, I can't talk. Um, and it was, you know, it was a goshawk. And, and I'm going to talk about that again because there's so much, in, so much small information can be so valuable. Um, so please have your bird book with you and, and let's make sure we're identifying the right species. Um, Ponderosa gam Ponderosa pine gamble oak is only 4% of this forest. That's tiny. For basically 49,000 acres. It occurs between 5,500 and 9,000 feet. It's dominated by pine and gamble oak. And you can have some other shrubs like New Mexico locust. You can have inclusions of mixed conifer with aspen, Douglas fir, and white fir. So let's clear this up now. There are no spruce on the Prescott National Forest. Okay. Those are white fir, okay? Somebody thought they were spruce. They named Spruce Mountain. Kind of like we have Lynx Lake. There are no lynx. That was a bobcat. So um, just so we're clear, those, what, those spruce are white fir. Um, historically, fire occurred every one to 15 years. It's really about five to seven years, that frequently, in the Pine Gamble Oak. And the lack of fire has created basically just unnatural conditions. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Personal favorite. Spend most of my career writing about this. One bird. Uh, the Mexican spotted owl is the number one species of interest in the pine gamble oak. Number one. Hands down, period, end of discussion. It's it. But this is, this is it. Limited personnel available to search, 49,000 acres. I have four people, okay? We have to make four visits. You have to send two people at a time together. We get winded out, all kinds of things happen. There are rigorous protocols to follow for Fish and Wildlife Service. You have official training to go to, to go look for these. You're not supposed to go look for these unless you've had the official training. I'm, I'm, I'm totally serious, I mean, I get scolded if we have people out looking for them that don't have the training. It's a le it, we're legally obligated, the Forest Service is. And the Forest Service does not, 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 not know where they all are. 
I cannot tell you how many times somebody will say, hey, self-spotted owl. I said, where? They're like, here. And I'm like, we don't know about that. And they're like, well, we thought you knew where they all were. No, I don't. Um, please do not go looking for them. I, I, I cannot stress that enough. I don't want you to go looking for them. If you are lucky enough to it, come across one, jackpot. Get your notebook out, get your camera out, and start taking notes. I would love a picture. I would love a quick picture. And if you can do it through your binoculars, if you're at a distance and you can do it through a scope or binoculars, that's even better because then you're not as, as close to the bird. Sometimes you inadvertently end up closer to the bird than you intend, back of the room there. And um, um, I would love if you could share any and all incidental spotted owl sightings on Forest Service and private lands. The reason that's so important is I'm only allowed to survey the Forest Service is only allowed to survey on Forest Service lands, on public lands. I'm not allowed to send my crew on private land. I don't think the birds stop at that little piece of barbed wire around the person's house and go, oh, I can't go on that, that's private land. Um, pretty sure they're using the private land, okay? Unless there's like a graduation party or, you know, weekend revelers. With a 600 acre territory, spotted owls, um, we, we map out 600 acres of Forest Service land for spotted owls. We don't include the private. So that's a bonus for them. I literally this week had someone tell me about a spotted owl on private land. He's like, oh, I thought you already knew. And it's literally between two areas that we've been surveying this year, finding no owls, and the birds in the, right in between. And if someone had told us that, it might have saved us some time and energy and had us get better information and made better use of our field time that's so limited. Because uh, right now we're all getting ready to go be busy doing some other things, as you can imagine, with the fire season. Spotted owl locations can influence our management when we find new locations. Butterfly. Most people probably know where Butterfly Spring is up on Mingus Mountain. Um, we had someone find a spotted owl in an area we never knew was there. And that changed how we were going to manage that piece of land. And some people think they're protecting the spotted owls by keeping their locations a secret from the Forest Service. What you don't understand is if I don't know it's there, I can't protect it. I'm going to manage that land as if the spotted owl isn't there. So there's no breeding season timing restriction. There's no changing in what we're doing. If I know about it, I can help it. But if I don't know, then I'm going to manage that landscape to reduce fuels, to restore fire, to restore forest health. And I can't do the things I need to do for the spotted owl where the spotted owl is. So it really is imperative that I find out about all the spotted owls so that I can do, I can manage better. So if you encounter a spotted owl, that, that picture is from someone in this room. Richard, thank you. Um, don't move closer to the bird, please. Don't move. I know they're docile. I know they're just so mellow. Um, but you're violating the Endangered Species Act because if you harm that, you're, in you're violating the Endangered Species Act. Take a picture if you can. And this is where if you can use your binoculars, there's a really cool thing. You put your cell phone up to your scope or your binoculars. And if you do, you practice on it before you get there. Because I've taken pictures of bald eagles across Lynx Lake that were decent through a scope. It's actually quite cool. Um, note the behavior and the location in the environment. Is it in a snag? Is it in a cavity? Is it on the ground, a branch? From the location, look around for other or young owls and don't search for them. Don't go looking for them. Just if you can do a 360, a lot of times they'll be on the next tree over and you just didn't, you hadn't gotten there yet. Um, if you can get a GPS point, you know, pull out your, your phone, depending if you have good service, and go boop, and then, and, and then name it later. Or if you know where you are on a trail or put a dot on a map, you're at the switchback, put a dot. Leave the area, and please don't go back, and please don't take all your friends, and please don't put it on eBird. 
um, that doesn't help the bird. Uh, coming back and sending it to this email address, nfletcher at fs.fed.us, that's helpful. <laughs> um, and uh, I love pictures, info, uh, all of that. I'm going to want phone numbers. Um, I promise I won't take a DNA sample or any blood, but um, I'm going to want some information, and I'm going to have people follow up with you. Um, and uh, so it, it's, you have no idea how valuable it is to us. Goshawks are also an important species in this PNBT. Here's the thing. Remember the kick, 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 kick. I'm not allowed to do that in the spotted owl nest area because it's a predator. Goshawks are predators for spotted owls. I don't want to call a goshawk to where I know there are spotted owls. So I can't survey for them the typical way we survey, which is to broadcast like that. So we can only silently do nest searches. So I'm going to tell you a story, and it's a true story, and it happened to me. Go back. Location, direction of travel or flight, behavior, age, and prey. I uh, cut my teeth as a wildlife biologist on the Tucson Ranger District, the south rim of the Grand Canyon. And we were doing um, a timber sale. And I had, I want to say, five different sightings of a goshawk. And I, every sighting was on this, this, this half-mile stretch of road. Every sighting, the goshawk was flying north to south. Every sighting. So I searched the north. I, 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 we, sc we scoured every bit of it. Nothing. So Mr. Aerial Photo Interpretation, I pulled out the aerial photos for the district, and I looked due south, and I found a really dense stand of ponderosa pines surrounded by PJ, and that's where the goshawk nest was. And it was only based on four or five sightings of a bird flying south across the road. So the direction the bird is flying can be incredibly valuable. Not just, hey, I saw a goshawk. I'm like, which, my, one of my first questions is going to be, which way was it flying? I'm going to ask you that. Um, you know, what was it doing? Uh, you know, was it, was it, if you're out in the woods and you come across a downed log or a stump and you see a pile of feathers, you could very well be within line of sight of a goshawk nest. It's called a plucking post. Typically, what they do is they get a little tid morsel, something good to eat, a little bird, and they don't want to take everything back to the nest because the entire bird is not edible, it's not nutritious. The feathers are no good. The head usually doesn't have a whole lot because you got all that, you know, the, the, the skull and everything. They want to, they, um, they'll, uh, sometimes they'll eviscerate it and just take, you know, the breast meat and the meat back so they can tear it and feed it uh, because the internal organs are a little, they're a little bit rich. They don't want that waste at the nest. They don't want the smell attracting predators. They don't want flies. They don't want parasites. So the plucking post very typically is within line of sight of the nest. So if you're cruising around and you see a pile of feathers, start doing this, start looking, and sometimes it's on the uphill side and you're going to be right at eye level with it. So that is a plucking post. Tell me about a plucking post, you know, or things like that. That is, I mean, do a little bit of investigation. Look, see, if you, if you do see a goshawk, boom, get a point and get out. And then come tell me. So pretty cool. Broadleaf lupin is a beautiful um, plant, typically found along riparian areas within the ponderosa pine forest. Um, it's listed as sensitive, but it's pretty prolific. So you don't have to tell me about that. Eastwood alum root, would like to know about that. That um, is found around the Senator Mine area. And um, it's fun when you search this, you get a lot of Clint Eastwood. So rip riparian, 1%, right? So far, I think I've covered one endangered species, right? And it was associated with the 4%, right? Well, here we go. Hold on. OK, get ready. So the riparian 1%, is, it ranges from 2,000 to 8,000, because this is everything, from the Verde on up to the headwaters of the Hacienda. Occurs along perennial or intermittent streams. Overstories typically include cottonwood, willow, sycamore, ash, alder, walnut, and box elder. Herbaceous plants include forbs, sedges, uh, rushes, and grasses. Historically, fire is infrequent in this. In this it just, what the, the role that fire plays is, Fire regulates the upland. 
fire regulates what's adjacent to it and keeps the pine and the juniper from coming down into the riparian by keeping it more thinned out on the upland. Fire regulates uh, the upland vegetation from encroaching into the riparian. So the least with the most. So one of the most limited habitat areas on the Prescott National Forest, most in demand by humans, is also the home to the most federally listed and sensitive species on the Prescott National Forest. A little bit insane. So here we go. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, Southwestern Willow Flycatcher. Um, as uh, your group very generously does your bird surveys on the Arizona Game and Fish Department uh, parcel. And those are so valuable because I am putting them together. Um, this week we had 20 willow flycatcher uh, detections on the, on the Verde River. 12 in one location and eight in another. So they're coming. Um, it is so valuable for me to know that so that I know they're there, they're at Perkinsville, and we're, you know, we're filling in the gaps of, of their distribution along the river. Um, and, and we're getting a better picture of that as we do more and more surveys. You really got to listen for the defining Fitzview. Really, really, that is the defining thing. And please don't attempt to approach or look in a nest. I will tell you that under our permit with the Fish and Wildlife Service, we're not allowed to. We're not allowed to. Don't get a mirror out. Don't go over. Don't go try to get up in the crotch of a tamarisk and get a picture. No. They will nest in tamarisk. They will use it unfortunately. I really would love a picture of a nest or a bird um, and then always get a location. Always, always, always. If I can know where there's a nest, it's going to have huge impacts on what we do in the river. Okay? okay. Yay! Um, love the cuckoo. Pretty bird. Love, love, love the call of this bird. <laughs> I'm not about to mimic it with my voice, but I do love the call of this bird. It's known from along the Verde River, Sycamore Creek by Dugas. Keep your ears open. I typically hear it, and sometimes don't ever see it. You don't need to see this bird to know you've, you've encountered a yellow-billed cuckoo. Um, but uh, if you hear it, take a point. Let me know. Um, and don't attempt to approach or look in the nest. We're not allowed to look in these nests either. Now, the spotted owl, we, we are, but uh, these were not. And get a picture if you can, and definitely always get a location. These, this is really important. And the date and the time, you know, the, the time, the date of your, of your sighting is going to be incredibly valuable, especially if it's outside the breeding season, then we know we have, you know, a migrant. If it's during the breeding season, whoo, bells and whistles, breeding season, nest, that is such valuable information you cannot begin to imagine, cannot it's so valuable. It's like gold to me. I, I, I love it. Um, the Gila Chub is an endangered fish that's known from along the Verde River. Um, if you catch one, because apparently you can if you're fishing in the Verde, uh, take a picture or, um, or if you see one in the water. So Gila Trout. Gila Trout are in Grapevine Creek. If you, if you see any fish in Grapevine Creek, no, I'm dead serious, um, because the trout were put there, but also speckled dace were. And with the fire last year, after the Goodwin fire, we are trying to get a, get a feel for, I think somebody has seen the, the dace in there. Now, the dace is adapted to events like the Goodwin fire because it's a southwest river fish. It's used to that. The Gila trout is not. So we don't know what happened to the population of, of, of Gila trout in Grapevine. We do not think they survived, unfortunately. But if you see any fish, um, and cool uh, macroinvertebrates, cool bugs in the water, very, that's important because it's, uh, especially in some of the smaller, more obscure um, uh, reaches, they're an indicator of the quality of the water. Razorback sucker, just cool fish, right? So if you can get a picture, you catch one. I'd love to know about it, especially. Now, okay, 
Don't go picking up the snakes, okay? Do I have to say that, really? I didn't think so. Um, this is the northern Mexican garter snake. And this is threatened, and these are known along the Verde River. Do not attempt to capture them, but oh my gosh, get a picture, and then the next bullet should say, please get a location, okay? Love to know about that. This next one is really cool looking. It is a funky looking snake, right? Are you gonna forget if you see one of those? No, I hope you don't. Um, take a good picture. Um, don't attempt, get a picture, and then, ah, right there, please get a location. Narrow-headed garter snake. So they're both highly aquatic snakes. They love water, um, and they're all along the Verde River and a little bit over on Sycamore. Round-tailed chub, known from the Verde Gap. Sycamore commonly found in pools. I, can't, I couldn't get everything in the water. The desert sucker. It's interesting, this one is, likes rapids and flowing water, and the Sonoran likes pools, okay? And the lowland leopard frog. It's known from our dirt stock tanks where you have, and streams with sufficient vegetation along the edges, also known in the Verde River. Now, um, I, ca I was um, going down on Turkey Creek, down below Cleeter, and uh, water was flowing, it was about knee deep, I actually have a picture to prove this. And um, I'm kind of walking around looking, and there are fish swimming in the water, you know, little fish swimming in the water. And the miner whose placer mining claim I was there to review kindly told me, how, how did he say that? There ain't no marine life in there. It was dry last week as the fish swam around my feet. And then I was able to reach down and there was a lowland leopard frog covered with mucus coming out of the bottom of what had been a dry stream the week before. Totally cool. So take a picture. Um, and um, I actually, you know, and, and here's the other cool thing. Um, lowland leopard frogs, uh, eggs are gonna be in a mass, okay? Toad eggs are gonna be in a string. So Arizona toad eggs are going to look like this, or our toad eggs, but the lowland leopard frog eggs are going to be in a mass. So several different uh, species that occur in various um, various vegetation types. I didn't want to lock this in, so you didn't. Golden eagles, any and all golden eagle sightings are incredibly important. Any and all, any and all, I want to know about them. Um, every known golden eagle nest is important. Um, if you know, if you see a golden eagle fly into a stick feature or, or a, a cliff nest, you have no idea the leverage that um, that wields when we go to Im, 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 uh, implement projects. I need to know that so I can protect that nest from disturbance. I learned a valuable lesson in the last um, six months to a year of analyzing a, a project up in Chino that's half a million acres. And we've got everyone's, uh, bald eagles are, are much more familiar with bald eagles. And you've seen the pictures of us climbing the nest and banding. And you've been to Lynx Lake and you, they'll, they'll roost on the edge of the lake and let you, I mean, I've, Everett's sending me pictures and it looks like he's like, like right underneath them. And they're very tolerant. Bald eagles are incredibly tolerant of people. Goldens hate us hate us. The game and fish will go to monitor a golden eagle nest and they get out of the car a mile away. Now they have spotting scopes. They get out of the car, I'm bad, a mile away and the eagles, goldens leave the nest. That's how susceptible they are to disturbance. So, do not approach the nest. Do not, 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 not. Get an approximate location. The nest presence will influence our implementation and email or text me ASAP. Because you're going to be supplementing. Game and Fish is an even smaller agency than Forest Service as far as monitoring. You could save them a helicopter flight if you can tell me I have a golden eagle, an active golden eagle nest. That's huge. I don't want you going looking for them, but if you find them, like you're out in one place and you're driving by and you see a golden eagle, stop, look, see where it's going. And if you see it fly into a butte or a rocky, oh, 
Okay, uh, okay, I gotta go tell Noel. Bald eagles, typically find close to water because that's where their primary food is, but they're known to nest, thank you Richard, in uh, riparian overstory, ponderosa pine, um, Del Rio Springs, along the Verde River. Um, I wanna know about all the bald eagles. Same thing, same reason. Roost sites, I still don't know where they're roosting in the Bradshaws, still wanna find that out. So let's recap. Please do not go looking for a lot of these species. You're violating the law if you do. But if you do happen to see them, how lucky are you? Because guess where I am? I'm sitting in a cubicle behind a computer and you're seeing them. So I'm jealous. Get a picture when you can without approaching the animal. Note coloration, distinguishing markings, number of animals. Make note of the behavior. Note where the animal is in the physical setting, in a cavity, on a log, flying, direction of travel. Please get a place marker, GPS point, or a point on a map. Please don't overstay your welcome if you're disturbing the animal because every piece of information helps me put together the rest of the picture. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. If there's time, I, I love questions. I love them. Love them. It, uh, those dogs, those deer, I see sometimes walking along my backyard and stepping over fences. Once I saw a one deer, another deer with horns, and two little ones following. Very good. Those no, those were um, um, mule deer. Oh. Mule deer. Mm -hmm. Any, any questions about? I really, I, I mean, I will thank you for forever for sightings. My question has to do with, for example, you were talking about the upper Verde, which is, as you know, the territory that Prescott Audubon monitors as part of an important bird area. And as you also know, there are yellow bill cuckoos there right. during the appropriate time right. of year. And there are nesting bald eagles on one of the transits, not the one you were on, not the one I was on. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> anyway. Um, but those are not Forest Service properties. Does that matter to you? Absolutely, because guess what's adjacent to them? The Forest Service. So we would be them. within the disturbance range. Like if it's on a cliff, the bald eagle, first quarter mile, you can't do anything. The next quarter mile is, has certain restrictions. And then there's another zone. So even if it's on private land, a lot of that private land isn't that big. It's surrounded by Forest Service land that's going to influence and impact or have a disturbance or change uh, the, the nature of that nest site. So it's absolutely critical to share things on private land with me that are next to. Now, if you're at Watson Woods, there's nothing I can do about that. It'd be a curiosity, and I'd love to know about it. But um, anything where you're near or on or adjacent to Forest Service land, is going to influence and be considered in our management of the, of the federal lands. That gives me a better picture. Absolutely. I still I st okay. I still would like to see it. Okay. We'll talk and I want to see it on the map. Because I don't monitor that. You don't know which okay. Somebody can tell me. I will. Kathy can help me put it on that. Um, any other questions? Yeah, okay. They want you to I'm okay, getting away with the mic then. Uh, you were down at the Highland Center recently. You were saying that per acre is about 200 like, pines per acre. What is it supposed to be in nature? Six to ten. Six to ten. Six to ten. Six to ten. And we're at 200. Because so the lack of fire has um, has created conditions where we have um, 20 times as many trees on the landscape as we should. And if we're 100% wrong, if 6 to 10 is 100% wrong and there should be 20 trees that size per acre, we still have 10 times as many trees as we should. And they're not able to get as big as we'd like them to be at, or to keep their crowns. Because ponderosa pine self limb because they don't like shade. So they end up with this tiny little bit of a crown and that's not enough to photosynthesize and, and maintain a healthy tree or resist bark beetles and things like that or, res or survive a drought. There was another question in the back. Um, I hope it's not an unfortunate question, but I think I remember 10 or 20 years ago an 
effort to bring the condor back into northern Arizona. Absolutely, they're, they're nesting up in the Vermilion Cliffs. Yeah, 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 they're, 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 they see them. I've personally seen them at the south rim of the Grand Canyon at Bright Angel. Tim? The, uh, just real quick follow up on that. The, the um, biggest danger to the California condors right now though is lead poisoning. Um, the California condors have gotten to a point, um, I apologize, I'm no all set. Um, the California condors have gotten to a point where they key on the sound of the shots. Um, um, the North Kaibab is, is a great deer hunting location, but they've gotten to where they hear that shot, they go in, they feed on it, and a lot of the mortalities that Game and Fish has found, because all of them have been marked, banded, and a lot of them radio telemetry, and they found that they're dying from lead poisoning, from eating those gut piles and ingesting the lead. And so they really are uh, encouraging people to use lead-free ammunition when they go up on the North Kaibab and anything that, that is adjacent to the Grand Canyon. Sorry, Thank you, Tim. Along that same line, I mean, not everybody just realized that 50% have a pack rack or something. I mean, if you poison them but try to kill them, how many, can they tell them they find a dead raptor if they've been poisoned from, from rat poison? I, I believe so. I'm not, I'm not as familiar with that, but yes, I mean, you, you get, an, if, if you poison a pack rat, will it, will it poison the raptor that may find it and eat it? Yes, it could, but um, um, I, go ahead, you, Matt. Um, so this is kind of a technology question in regards to the use of smartphones and technology uh -huh. that the individual now uses today. So 20 years ago, when you were searching for any documentation in the field by anyone, and it didn't avail itself all that often, I'm sure. And now today, things are showing up probably pretty frequently. Yep. So are we talking a thousand percent increase in reportings on the species you're looking for just because this is being carried? Uh, I, 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 I'm not getting a whole lot more reports on them. I'm not. And that's kind of why I'm here tonight, is because I want them. <laughs> I want them. Um, what I keep running into is people think they're doing a favor by keeping it a secret. And they're actually doing a disservice to those species by keeping it a secret. They think it's protecting it. By not knowing it's there, I can't do my job and manage public land for the benefit of those uh, threatened and endangered species. So that's why it's, it's I, I, imperative that I know. So I have a stack of business cards, and I can't wait to hand them out at the end of the meeting. One, go ahead. You said the Mexican spotted owl had a search for 600 acres. They've done telemetry studies. Does that mean there's no overlap if they won't tolerate? Um, we try not to overlap the territories. We try, when we delineate it on the ground, they can be within a mile of each other, or half a mile of each other, but um, no, not, not much tolerance, no. Um, that 600 acres is, is based on the need to find enough groceries to raise babies. So I think if we can improve the forest condition to provide more groceries, they won't need as much acreage. But that's my personal opinion. Matt. One more. So 20 years ago, I was under contract working with Dan doing surveys for spotted owls in some pretty crazy places like up by Camp Wood. To find any? No. I, what I'm wondering is, is where, what is the oddest kind of nest site that you've... Nest sites. See, I thought you were just going to say location. Because the oddest location is Sienega Creek by I-17. Um, and I also had a sighting in Dugas. Um, nest site. Because um, these, these owls will nest in canyons and um, stovetop, stovepipe um, snags. They'll go dip right down in. That kind of stuff. Um, on the, on the, let's say the west side of Maverick, where you've got that really funny um, white fur, that abuts chaparral, and there's do you I, could be in that white fur. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. That's why I said you know those small inclusions. 
we can't dismiss those. You know, um, I just heard about an owl this week that was at a spring surrounded by chaparral. I'm like, okay. So, and I didn't know about it because somebody thought I knew about it already, and I didn't. So I need to know. Any other, I'll stick around afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>